resting bitch face, right? Can I say this? Can I curse on your show? Yeah. I, didn't I say what the fuck lines? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Um, there are days where I just have unbelievable mood swings and I'm not normally that type of person. And I can only, I can only assume that it's the M word Yeah, that I don't even like to say. Because it's pre, so it's not the M. Okay. You can call it Perry, like it's a nickname. Okay. <laughs> like, like it's a date. Yeah. So anyway, so with Perry, I become enraged. <laughs> Right. Welcome to the My Aloof Vagina podcast, where we explore the distress and surprise of our midlife transitions. We take menopause seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. And we believe that learning what to expect in perimenopause can be entertaining. It's inevitable. So we may as well equip ourselves and have a good time. On today's show, I talk to my friend Stacy and find out what it's like to wait for the menopause symptoms to show up and then have your big sign be your period shifting a little at 55 and just poof, ending in a span of less than three months. Oh, and mood swings, just crazy mood swings. And what about those periods? What drastic intervention are some doctors offering as a solution when we report heavy periods in our 40s or early 50s? It's upsetting, but it's something you should know. And finally, what's a surefire way to make 30-year-old guys realize you're more than old enough to be their mom? And will that stop them from hitting on you? So stick around. We have the answers to all of those questions for you on this episode of My Aloof Vagina. By the way, I would love to stay in touch. So please join my email list at sisterhood.myaloofvagina.com. You'll always be the first to know what's going on and I promise not to spam you. At this point in my life, I'm just too lazy. I'm your host, Martha. And when Stacy joined me, I surprised her by showing up with no makeup, a ponytail, a full forehead of frownies, and a weird neck mask that kind of went up around my neck and over my ears. She'd been concerned about her appearance after a workout and coming straight to the recording session, and so I figured that I would remind her who she was dealing with and that I'm not that serious. We quickly started addressing the burning questions and found ourselves talking about how Age kind of sneaks up on you. The shocking thing about aging is that you look in the mirror some days and you're like, well, who is that? Like, I don't even recognize this person looking back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I worry about my appearance. Obviously, I'm vain and we're on camera all the time now. And so we're more aware than ever. But I also am realizing that we don't actually pay that much attention to each other. We're not as scrutinized by others as we think. It's funny, too, because I'll see people that I went to high school with and I'll be like, oh, wow, she got old. And then I'm like. Oh, wait, I look just like her. When we're like 75, are we going to be attracted to like 40-year-old guys? Or are we going to be attracted to like 70-something-year-old people? Like cause now I look at I'm thinking like a 25-year-old guy, maybe he's got a great body, but I'm not attracted to that because like they're, they're like a baby. They're like a mental baby. So I'm thinking to myself, like, do, you, do you stay attracted to the age that you're at? Yeah, I, I just had this conversation with someone I had dated in my 20s and he was nine months younger. And that seemed like a big deal. Right. So he spoke that I was robbing the cradle. So I recently saw him and he said something about, well, you always liked younger guys. I said, what are you talking about? I've never dated a guy younger. And he said, me himself. And I'm like, yeah, that doesn't count. But other than that, it's always been guys my age or at most two years older. I'm very in my zone. I like being able to connect on things and having shared history through pop culture and perspectives. I like someone to understand my jokes. For yeah, instance. or know how to read a map. Like, like kids. Well, yeah, those read things too. Read a map or turn the channel on the TV. Address an envelope. You know, those sexy, sexy things. Right, right, right. So my son is in his younger 30s and guys his age are kind of into me. I just don't understand how they don't know. It's so obvious to me (laughs) how old I am and that I could be their mother. But then when they find out, they act shocked. And I think, oh, how flattering. That's so cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you don't really mean that. But also they're like making the moves. And I'm like, are they just not realizing that I'm my age or do they not care? But there's no way 
I'm not even going to make out with a guy in his 30s. It makes me uncomfortable to even think about it. That would feel really weird to me. Like, I would feel, like, morally wrong, even though they're adults, right? Right. I mean, a 30-year-old man is a man. Right. But it's just too much for me. And I know I have friends who who insist, because I am single, they're like, you've got to try it. You need to, if you're attracted to him, just one of those times, just, like, do it and see how things go. I just haven't had the guts to do it. I wouldn't wear the thing. <laughs> right. Well, this this always tips them off. The frownies always tip them off that I might be a little bit older. I cannot wait to see the final product because if that works, I'm going to be like lathering them, ev- you know, like <laughs> everywhere, everywhere. I've been using them now for nine months. They only work here because it's about repetitive muscle. It's basically the poor girl's Botox or the anti-Botox Botox because it, prevents you from scowling. And so mm. a lot of us, I turn out to be one, scowl in our sleep. So you just wear them at night and then you're like saving yourself that seven or eight hours of scowling. So I just left them on for the sight gag. I no longer tell my friends they could benefit from frownies because nobody wants to hear that I'm noticing their what the fuck lines. Frownies gave me a discount and I'm able to pass that discount along to other people. So I think that's an affiliate, which makes me feel super official. So if you want to try frownies, and I do really truly recommend them, you can use my code MAV10. So it's M-A-V for my aloof vagina and you'll get 10% off. I think at some point they may send me a fruit basket or something. Not really sure how this works, but I'm sure I'll figure it out as I become more professional. There is always now going to be a link in the show notes, which makes me feel like I'm really, really doing this podcasting thing, right? I'm really glad that you're talking about this because now that I've started to talk about it because I'm in it and people my age are going through it. So like the RBF, when I say like typically, no, this is my face, resting bitch face, right? Can I say that? Can I curse on your show? Yeah. Didn't I say what the fuck lines? Oh, (laughs) you're welcome. (laughs) Right now, though, although I'm a genuinely positive, happy person and I'm intentional, um, there are days where I just have unbelievable mood swings and I'm not normally that type of person. And I can only I can only assume that it's the M word. Yeah. That I don't even like to say. Because it's pre. So it's not the M. Okay. You can call it Perry, like it's a nickname. Okay. Like like it's a date. Yeah. So anyway, so with Perry, I become enraged, right? And then sometimes two minutes later, I'm like crying, you know, it's just like, I feel like I'm crazy. And I know that typically I am not. I feel like I am. My PMS, I could tell like, oh, if I didn't know, I'd look at the calendar. Oh my gosh, it's day 27, right? You can predict it. Yeah. Now, who knows? So I was at a conference and I had just had my period. So I didn't bring stuff. And I, at this conference, had the heaviest murder scene period I've had in a while. I had had no product. I had nothing. I'd been very disciplined in the way I packed. And so I didn't have any extraneous clothing. So I had to wash leggings. I had to wash... Uh, my jeans, which took days to dry. And of course my underwear. And then also somehow I got it on my shirt. I don't know. I felt like a 13 year old, you know? How did you get it there? I don't know. And it got on the outside of my pajamas, just a big splash. So I basically had things hanging all over the hotel room. And then I was rinsing out the towels because I didn't want to leave bloody towels. It just, and then, so I called the friend desk. Like, yeah, I called the friend desk. I'm like, Hey, I'm having an emergency. And I explained it to her and she said, we don't have any, but I have some in my purse. Oh. And I was, I was like, oh my gosh. She said, want me to bring them up? I'm like, no, I've, I've fashioned something with <laughs> you some things I have. Yeah. Between your legs. Yeah. And then she said, do you want overnight or light day? I'm like, overnight. So I got two. They were still pretty thin because she's, you know, in her 20s. I'm like, these were not going to, these were not really yeah. going to last me. And I thought, oh, well, I'll go to the CVS. But then I was running around. I went to the next hotel. It got worse. I called downstairs and said, hey, do you guys have anything? And they sent up an emergency bag. I cannot be the only woman. They had a little bag with a variety of different things in it. So they have a surprise. I have my period bag ready to go. Yeah. So I'll Aww. be back at that. Was there a little Hershey kiss in there? Well, the that's, chocolate? that's what I would have added. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So that was... So I ended up basically wearing cashmere sweatpants for two days of the conference because I didn't have any dry pants to wear. That's horrible. I know. No one knew. They just thought I was casual. I was wearing my Adidas. Yeah, yeah, well, I laid back. Yeah. Like, oh, look at her. She's like, she's like a middle-aged lady rapper. 
Now, are you getting the mood, the mood fluctuations and like the energy fluctuations? Do you get that? No. And so that, that to go back to that, that is, first of all, depression in the lead up to this is very common. And women get misdiagnosed all the time with just depression. They get given meds that don't help. And then people, people get divorced. You know, women are raging and don't know what right. it's from. And maybe, you know, I, I want to talk to you about this. So there's this concept I'm calling canary in the coal mine because everything I was taught was that I was going to get hot flashes and then my right. periods would become irregular and then stop and I might have insomnia. Those are the things. And I would look old, right? Right. And so the the constellation of symptoms that I had, I did not recognize for years that I was entering into this. And so I imagine if someone is in their mid forties and starts right. to hate their husband periodically and have some other things that they don't recognize, then you could maybe think it was your relationship, you know, yeah. or screaming at your children and you think you've got bad kids. If there's no one to say, oh, wait, this is a really common thing. This depression is a really common symptom. And the rage is a really common symptom. Also the weeping and that it might come long before the hot flashes, I think that would help. And that's one of the reasons I'm talking about it. Because mine, of course, was my, I had clitoral atrophy. I didn't really have it, but I had a change in sexual response. Yeah. That was my, my yeah. indicator. And then I went on this research jag, found out about clitoral atrophy and freaked out and told my friends. It turned out that wasn't what the issue it was. It freaked me out. It is a freak yeah. out. It's like, what? Yeah. Yeah. What? They should, that should be, your gynecologist should be mentioning it every year. FYI, right. there are hormonal causes, but there's also, your body is very, very efficient. It does not waste resources where it's not used. Yep. So if you're not using your clitoris, then you are facing- got to take it out for a spin. You got to take it out for a spin. You got to show her a good time because it slowly will just kind of shrink and slowly all that peripheral circulation- Right. Your body will stop expending the energy to to nourish it. If anyone had told me, I would have been doing this. This is a calling. Like you need to <laughs> tell the masses about this. Well, we call it CA so that we can speak about it in mixed company and yeah. be really open about it. But yeah. So the CA, learning about CA led to this and really alarmed me. But then when I looked back and examined, there were a number of symptoms that I had that no one had told me might be this. And if they had, mm -hmm. maybe I could have dealt with some of them sooner. So my canary in the coal mine turned out to be this sexual response. What was your canary in the coal mine? What was the thing that happened that made you realize, oh, I might, I might be going through this thing? You know what? This is the interesting thing. So I don't know. It wasn't until like just recently. So I had an app on my phone because we we got married late. I had kids very late. And so I spent my whole adult life trying to not get pregnant so that when I got married and got pregnant, I mean, when I was going to try, I thought, oh, I'm going to go off the pill and just get pregnant. You know, like you just have sex and get pregnant. So I started tracking. I use an app. I so I knew that my periods were like really regular because once I had gone off the pill, like I had no idea if I was regular or regular or nothing because I'd been on the pill forever. So I have this app. I get pregnant at 37. I get pregnant at 39. So like I'm 40 years old. So I've been, and then I had a miscarriage in between. So from 36 till almost 40, I was pregnant and nursing. So I'm like 41, 42 years old. And like everything that's like going haywire, like that's when women start to go through things. But I thought, like you said, it's going to be hot flashes and it's going to be, I'm not going to get my period. Well, I haven't had a single hot flash at all and have been like the poster child for regularity until last year. My period was like five weeks instead of four. And then, so then I got it. And then same thing, five weeks instead of four, like spread out a little bit. Then August was my last period. So I didn't even have this like long drawn out, you know, get it, not get it. I haven't had a period since August. And then I'm like, oh, well, maybe, maybe it's the, maybe it's happening. Like maybe. And then I was like, I was getting these moods. Like I was having PMS. But it was worse than PMS. And then I was getting like crazy, like crazy to the point where like, I don't cook. Like I, I did. I just don't prefer it. I'll do it for survival. But I'm not a baker and I don't really cook. And then back in December, I'm driving home from church and I'm like, I want bread. I'm like, and I just kept thinking, I want bread. I want bread. Like a big, like sourdoughy thing. And so like, I just drove home 
And then I'm just laying around. I'm just kind of no energy, super low energy. I'm like, I'm going to bake bread. It was like the weirdest thing. Like, I don't, I, I've never baked bread in my life. So I Google a recipe. I'm like, well, I guess I'll bake bread. So now I'm like, I happen to have yeast. Who even knew that I had yeast, had flour? So now I'm doing this thing. And I'm like, well, this better be good because I, I like, I really want it now. And then I'm just like, it was the most bizarre thing that I'm doing this whole recipe. And then when I realized I had to put a blanket, like a towel over it and put it in the stove, in the fridge overnight, I'm like, fuck, it's not even going to be ready today. I was pissed. I was like, I want this bread. And it was, that is just, if you know me, you know, I don't cook, which is, and, and Bill wakes up because he works nights and he'd been sleeping all day. He wakes up and he gets, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm getting bread. And he was like, what? Then the next day, like, thank God it rose like it, like it's supposed to. Thank God it turned out that it came out. It was delicious and amazing. And my son and I ate the entire loaf in like maybe two hours. It was, I was that crazy that I baked bread. Like that is so beyond my personality or whatever. But that was the kind of weird stuff for me, you know? So that's your canary then, in a coal mine. Sorry. It was, I, ba- I was baking bread. And then this, and then just the low energy. Like I have, I'm, I, I exercise every day. I, I have a high energy and I literally don't want to do anything. Like, and I just would lay, I just would lay in bed and I'm laying there because everything was an effort and I really wanted to cry but it was an effort. Like even crying was an effort. And that's not my nature. You know what I mean? That's not me normally. And then poof, it's over. One of the things I think that's hard about that, about the depression and the low energy. So I've lost a lot of ambition, frankly. Like I was a very ambitious person. I'm just not as ambitious anymore. But what I'm finding as I'm talking to people, I think it's going to be pretty hard for those of us who are of a certain age. We're all, you and I are in the very close age group. And the women I'm talking to are kind of in this bubble of of age. And we're, that means a lot of us are entering into this and entered into this during that three-year pandemic. And I- I was chalking it up to that. Yeah, me too. I was chalking it up to like, and um, so yeah, so I thought that I just was, I I was chalking everything to the pandemic. And I think a lot of people are. I don't think they realize, or women of our, of our age, that it's not the pandemic. And I remember, it was probably about seven years ago. I think it was the beginnings of it. I remember thinking, I'm going to go to my doctor because I was like, I'm going to get on meds. Like, I'm going to get on meds. I think I should get on meds. And I had gone to my doctor and said, is there something you can give me for my PMS symptoms for the maybe 20 days a year that I felt really bad? And the only thing that he offered me was a prozac type of pill. And I was like, I don't want to change my entire brain chemistry for like the 20 days that I don't feel good. So he goes, well, if you're having a rough day, take Xanax. And I was like, okay. So the next time I felt like I needed it, I don't know if you've ever taken Xanax. No. Okay. I took it and I fell asleep. I'm like, I can't drive a car on this. Like, and I'm sure people take a therapeutic level, but I had never taken it. So it made me fall asleep. And then I was like, well, I, this isn't going to work. So there was literally nothing. There was no solution. Yeah. And then this this last time he said, you're definitely starting on like you're some kind of lining. I don't even remember what he said. Do you know what that is? Um, like I, thinning or? Yeah, it depends. But yes, as your estrogen declines, you will have less of a lining in your uterus. That's kind of why you stop having a period. Progesterone can also do that. So you can take progesterone in case you're having heavy periods and that will help. Um, reduce the lining, but ultimately you get to the point where you're you're just not collecting blood and lining in your uterus anymore, and that's why periods stop. Isn't it crazy that I don't even know these things that are happening in my body? I I don't even know, and I'm an educated person. Like I don't know these simple things. But he said to me, we are talking about libido, and I said I don't have as much interest. He goes, yeah, that's going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it. And I'm like, what? Yeah. But you guys have Viagra. Like, can I have something? Like, there's nothing. It's so and annoying. The is too bad. It's, and I'm like, yeah. I mean, part of the, the whole thing, like I went on the hunt for a doctor who specialized in menopause because of the sexual thing. And because I was very motivated. I wanted to have a good time and I wanted to be responsive. And, right. Right. And I wanted this relationship. And I don't know that I would have found any solutions if I had just been going to my regular doctor because I mentioned it to them and even my gynecologist and something came up and she said, oh, you know, well, if, if that happened again, we would just, we just give you a hysterectomy. And I didn't react to what she had to say. 
but in my head, I thought, thank God, thank God I have found additional healthcare support because a lot of my friends had hysterectomies prematurely. They're surgeons. They're not endocrinologists. They're not hormone specialists. They are surgeons. So, you know, to a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. To a surgeon, every problem that you can fix with surgery. And so the solution, the instant solution was, well, just take it. You don't need it. And (laughs) my menopause doctor would never just off the cuff, knowing nothing about my life or my plans, suggest a hysterectomy for a non-pathological problem. Why don't we find the cause and address that instead of just masking symptoms? So taking out your uterus, is that going to solve your problem? Well, it would solve that problem because I have had fibroids in the past and I had a major surgery for my fibroids years ago, which by the way, now I realize all of the stuff around that was perimenopause, but no one mentioned it to me. I was with the best surgeon in the country and no one ever said, oh yeah, this all is related to perimenopause. Oh, and the fact that you have heavy periods even after that related to perimenopause, no one ever said a word. The reason we need to have you taken iron and you're bleeding so much perimenopause, right? right? What she was saying is, I said, I want an ultrasound just to make sure that the fibroids haven't come back. And she said, well, if they did, we would just give you a hysterectomy because I mean, it's a, a much easier surgery. It's much less bloody. You don't need your uterus. And this is a very good doctor. And even a really good doctor was saying that. And I, I, you know what your uterus does? And by the way, many people have had to have hysterectomies for good reason. And some people have had them for no good reason because it's such an easy thing to recommend. And some people want them, but your uterus holds all your stuff up. Yeah. So it does have a purpose. Like a shelf. Yeah, like a <laughs> shelf. My my uterus has more purpose than just making babies, it turns out. Right. And there are probably yeah. things we won't know for 10 or 20 more years because they don't study us closely enough. But there are indicators that your uterus does things, that it, that it helps release certain hormones and certain things that support you through this journey. That someone would just yank it out because it's easy and it's covered by insurance with basically no argument is yeah. upsetting to me. And so I sat in that room liking her for a lot of reasons and also thinking, oh my God, this is why I have a podcast. Because even though I'm like, yuck, 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 hardy, hard, hard, like it's a comedy podcast, I do also want to be able to provide another outlet for women to learn things and learn from each other. Because several of my friends who had hysterectomies, it was because they had heavy periods and their doctor said, well, we can just take it out. And they had them. And now when we talk, they say, I can't believe that my doctor ordered a hysterectomy when I could have just taken progesterone. I could have gotten an IUD. That progesterone would have reduced my bleeding and made my boobs stop hurting. Because a lot of them also had like serious breast pain from the estrogen level. So the fact that they went in complaining of breast pain and heavy bleeding, for that to be just removing the uterus instead of saying, oh, we have to balance out your progesterone with your estrogen, your obviously high estrogen, is insane. It's insane. And I think if we don't know to advocate for ourselves, because we don't even know those are the options, we're not talking about it. And so I'm hoping, Martha, with your podcast and raising awareness that more women will talk, because there's things I don't even know that are going to happen to me, or the fact that I didn't get a hot flash. And up until like three months ago, I was still getting a period. I didn't realize I was in it. I feel like it's really important because it's this taboo subject, at least in my mind, it's this taboo subject that no, because nobody I know is talking about it. I mean, it's, well, it's, it's taboo. People are talking about it privately. Some people are talking about it widely. And of course, now I've plugged myself in the algorithms serving up every, everyone who wants to talk about their vagina is like showing up in my feed. Right. So, so my worldview has shifted, but it's one-on-one and it's with friends or girlfriends. And even in groups, I have three group chats in my life that are girlfriends from different stages in life. And even in those, I know that some people are suffering and not talking, even if we're being open and joking. But I definitely feel like we are restricted and not talking about it. Maybe because it's sexually related. Maybe because we live in a youth culture where youth is so valued. You don't want to tip anyone off. Like I'm single. Do I want men to know that I, you know, I'm not having this one, but when I have vaginal dryness, am I going to want to talk about that in public? How about itchy, itchy vagina, which apparently is a very common symptom. So all of these things, 
there are reasons why you don't want to talk about it. I'm like very open. Somebody will scratch your itch, Mark. Listen, if I, I'm pretty sure if I went up to one of those 32 year olds, I'm older and I need someone to scratch my vagina with their young penis. <laughs> That, kind of a little tickler. Yeah, I'm sure you could find, they could use their fingers, they could do whatever they needed. I, in fact, I am not picky. They can use whatever they want. But um, so I think that there are reasons because you can't unlink it from sex. Yeah. And sex is taboo in our culture. Aging is kind of taboo in our culture. Mental illness is kind of taboo. These are things that are start, people are starting to talk about, but they didn't talk about right. before. So I think that's right. why it's such a thing. Right. And I would think with the, it's funny about the sex being taboo part, that everything, if you look at like TV or ads or movies or whatever, they're using sex for everything there. But yet over here, it's not the thing. And I feel like for people who have had a healthy sex, after you've been married a while, it's super comfortable and it's fun. And all of a sudden now there's like no interest. And I want that part back. Like where to go and how do I get it back? And that is really something that sucks. Imagine too, like here he is getting older too, wondering, she not into me anymore? You know what I mean? W will you come back? Can we talk That's another cool. time? I would love to explore that because it is definitely a thing. Before we end, I want to ask you, what are the things that have changed that you're actually kind of happy about? I mean, I do like the not getting a period part. What's your thing? Um, that kind of the I don't give a fuck stuff. I'm a little more I don't give a fuck than I used to be because I think I was so ambitious before and so wanting to be a good brand representation for other people that there were things I didn't do because they just weren't becoming. Now, I listen, I had a lot of things that people would think aren't becoming and people who know me would say, what what didn't you do? Because we've seen what you've we done. We are wearing frownies right now. Right, right. But th there's a level of, there's just something and I don't, I can't even put my finger on it, but it's shifted. And I thought it was just the pandemic, right? Because we, we were all going to die and then we lived. But I, I actually now recognize it's kind of the shift in, in me and I'm happy. So I'm also on a mission. My PSA is I want women to track their periods because they don't all track them. And what happens is people don't have periods for a while and they say, oh, maybe I'm in menopause. And they don't know the date of their last period. Right. And then they don't right. know what day because menopause is just one day. Your perimenopause and then your postmenopausal. Menopause is just the day that is one year since your last period. Oh. So I want them to track it so they know when it comes up. App right now. Yeah. I'm gonna tell you when my right. So um if I didn't have an app, it says I'm 148 days late. Yeah. I should have gotten a period. I'm a little late. I'm either pregnant or I'm in menopause. Right, right, right. I like that you said, I don't want to lose that. You've been married a long time, but you also got married later. And Late. I think mm -hmm. that there are a lot of different experiences and I want to explore all of them. I think it's okay for a woman mm. to be married a long time and and their relationship is one where they're like, he doesn't really want to, I don't really want to do it anymore. I, I, I'm I glad to be past it. <laughs> I want to be Grandma Moses and focus my attention. I, on the other hand, had all that celibacy and kind of felt like Rip Fadge Winkle. Like I woke up at 50 and I hadn't had sex in almost a decade and I don't I don't want to have missed out. On great sex. And so yeah. I'm still like, I, like if we, this is the Golden Girls, I'm Blanche. Like yeah, right, I'm right, hot right, right. to trot trying to find a man, except I'm not yeah. really trying to find a man. I just really want to have a healthy sex life. Right, right. right. I guess I need a yeah, man for luck. that kind of, but um, it's, it's, it's a different, it's like a very self-serving desire. So I was a little nervous. I thought you were going to ask me to actually talk about my vagina. So thank you for not doing that. You know what? I really should add that into the, guest email that I never sent you and say, hey, I'm, you're not going to talk about your vagina. Yeah. But you know, who knows? I'm so comfortable. Maybe next time. Who knows? Um, but, listen, we're only talking about my vagina. It's my, my vagina is the star. I have one too. Okay. Well, oh, see, listen. Mine is just as important as yours. I can make this competition. You'll come on and you'll spill all the vagina details. So, so I don't know. You'll totally win that one. Thank you for listening. Until next time, take care of yourself and take care of your vagina. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend you think would enjoy it too.